and thank you for checking out my YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I'm your host, Nick Barksdale, and today I actually have a very special guest with us today who's going to discuss history and actually give us the view and insight into this subject. And if you find teaching history interesting, if you want to learn more about this subject in general, this is going to be a great example for you to actually take a look at. I'm joined today by Dr. Soberad, and he is going to tell us a little bit about himself before we jump into his presentation. Doctor, I'm going to let you take it from here. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Lane Soberad. I'm a research associate in the College of Education at Texas Tech University, uh, where I also serve as an affiliated faculty member to the uh, Medieval and Renaissance Studies Center uh, and am an instructor in the Department of History. I also serve as the Director of Outreach and Digital Media for the Texas Medieval Association. Um, my primary fields of research interest of late have been on teaching history, especially at the undergraduate level, uh, and the methods uh, and strategies involved in that. Uh, my primary focus on med medieval research uh, is primarily on high medieval chronicles in England and France, uh, focusing specifically on the construction uh, and writing of those texts. Uh, so today, Nick, I'm going to talk about um, what history is as I understand it. Uh, this lecture I typically give uh, as an introduction to my medieval survey course. Um, and uh, I, I, my goal here is to introduce students to what, uh, what I define history is and interpret the field of history as uh, and why uh, it's it's much more than a collection of things that happened a long time ago. So what we're going to be talking about today um, is an introduction to history as a concept, as a discipline, um, as and as a thing you have to study uh, if you are anybody from the ages of about uh, five to maybe 22 if you've made your way into college. So there's two basic functions that an introductory college history course has. Um, first, it's supposed to provide you, the student, um, even if you are an informal student for the purposes of things like YouTube channels, uh, with content that is fundamental and essential to the discipline. Second, history is supposed to provide you an opportunity to apply that basic content, uh, whether that's through an examination, through writing an essay, reading a book, however you're engaging with the past. You're supposed to learn the skills in order to appropriately engage the discipline. And the hope here is that those skills stick with you and some of the fundamental information sticks with you so that later on in your life, career, job, social interactions with other people, uh, that information and those skills you have to rely upon uh, either to advance your work, to make yourself sound smarter, to get a promotion, whatever the case happens to be. But what we find often happens is that in introductory history courses or with novice historians and the audience for this YouTube channel, uh, I'm probably assuming are a bunch of novice historians, uh, is, that, is that introductions to history try to overload you with facts and dates and brief surveys of historical events. Uh, that is uh, uh, the cliche, a mile wide and an inch deep is probably applicable here. And that's because in any history class that most of you have probably taken, you have to cover a thousand years of history or 500 years of history. In the case of classes that I've taught, like Western civilizations, you have to cover 15,000 years of history. You can't possibly do that in a semester. You can't do that in a year. Um, and in, in historians' careers, we oftentimes spend decades studying uh, you know, 10 or 20 years of history, and we still don't get the complete picture. So by way of illustration, let's take a guess as to how many documents are in the Library of Congress. And let's be even more specific. How many documents do you think that the Library of Congress has just from the life of George Washington? Last time I looked, that number was over 140,000 distinct documents. That is a lot. That is a lot for any one person to try and get a handle on. This makes it difficult to structure a course for you uh, for, for people that I typically have as students, if I'm doing, let's say, a survey of the first half of U.S. history up to the Civil War, there's no reasonable way to include all 140,000 of those things. It's impossible, much less the stuff about Jefferson and the colonies and Native Americans um, and slavery and all the other things we have to talk about in the context of the first half of U.S. history. So what do I leave in? What do I leave out? 
That is the eternal struggle of the historian, especially in the context of teaching or explaining a particular historical uh, phenomenon uh, to somebody in the general public, uh, to any kind of audience in their own research, uh, or indeed to what we often consider our most important audience, which is our students. And this is not just a conscious action by history professors who build a course. It's also an ine that inevitable part of professional historical research. If I'm writing a book, uh, I cannot, as, as Mark Block said about uh, 70 or 80 years ago, uh, I cannot know everything about everything. I can't even know everything about one thing. And so the act of writing or, or pursuing history is in and of itself a selective process. And so today we're going to talk about what history is, what historians do. Uh, and uh, indeed, one important thing to establish in any field is basic technical vocabulary. So the most basic technical definition we need to talk about for history is the word history. Where does it come from? Uh, well, uncreatively, uh, it comes from the Latin word historia, which means uh, in, in its basic sense, uh, the same thing that it does for us, a narrative account of something that happens in the past. Uh, but as many Latin words are, um, they have uh, an older root uh, in ancient Greek, uh, where historia is uh, more basically a learning or knowing by inquiry. And in the context of the historical discipline, that is uh, inquiring about something in the past and coming to some sort of conclusion that we know something about the thing we inquired about. That comes from an older uh, uh, verb that simply means to inquire, uh, which comes from its base word, istor, uh, uh, which is, uh, as far as I could tell, a wise man or judge. So if we look at the etymology of the word history, what we're trying to do is make some sort of inquiry about the past, uh, learn something, acquire knowledge, and then make some sort of conclusion about, that is, judge um, those things that happened in the past based on that information and using our logical and rational faculties to make that determination. That is, uh, uh, implicit in here is we're always working with incomplete information. And the best that we can do is make some sort of reasonable conclusion about what happened, why it happened, and who it happened to based on that incomplete set of data. And that will always be the case about history uh, unless somebody develops a time machine. Right. And even then, somebody uh, we're going to be working with uh, 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 the person who went back in time's account of what they observed in the past. Uh, we are never getting firsthand information, period. So in that communication of the past, we have to talk about language and communication. Those are the two essential tools we have uh, to talk about the past, to engage with the past, um, and to teach uh, or, or inform others about those things we're investigating. And so we lead to a basic question. What is this thing that you see on the screen right now? Well, in basic terms, what we see is a picture of something. And that drawing is of uh, what type of object? And it's at this point, if I was teaching this in a classroom, I'm hoping for uh, responses from people. Uh, if you are in the audience here, feel free to respond like you're watching uh, uh, Barney or Blue's Clues. Um, <laughs> I, I encourage that type of participation. And so this looks like something that could be really old. This is obviously not a photograph of something. It is a rendering of something. And if you are particularly astute, you may recognize that this is a rendering of a clay tablet. You may also recognize that this is not a complete clay tablet. It is a partial clay tablet. Those of you who are, who are maybe had an ancient history class or your Western Civ uh, teacher or European history teacher maybe started uh, way back at the beginning of human civilization, uh, may recognize this kind of writing as cuneiform writing. Um, cuneiform, if we go back to some etymology again, uh, uh, cuneus meaning wedge and form meaning shape, it is the wedge-shaped writing. Um, and if you may imagine writing on a clay tablet using anything other than a stick is probably going to be pretty difficult. Yeah. And so the way cuneiform writing works is that we impress the, uh, the stylus into the clay and then pull in one direction or the other and we get writing that looks like this. So the question surrounding this cuneiform writing is what's being communicated? What's on this clay tablet? What is the author uh, or the creator of this clay tablet trying to say? Here's your time for audience response. Now, I'm assuming none of you read any of the cuneiform languages. 
Indeed, there's only a few dozen people who actually claim to, to be able to interpret these things. I can't read it. I'm assuming nobody in the audience can read it. So what use is this thing? It's not a picture. It's not a photograph. It's a diagram of uh, a rendering of this thing. And in some sense, that's one of those basic questions about history, too. What good is this historical source if we can't read it, if we can't access the information that is contained within the source? And indeed, that is the role uh, historians like me sometimes play, is as translator's interpreter for a wider audience. So this thing, by the way, is, uh, is, is what we call a Hurrian hymn, as one of the oldest forms of musical notation uh, that we know about. Uh, this particular one was found uh, in the ancient city, uh, and I may be butchering the pronunciation here, uh, the ancient city of Ugarit, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, if you Google Hurrian hymn, you'll find all sorts of resources, uh, and I think Nick is going to link, um, uh, link a particular document from a, from a recent exhibit from the Guggenheim Museum uh, on Hurrian hymns. Absolutely. And so what we're talking about here, folks, uh, is, is trying to define history from a, for a modern audience based on definitions we've had for history in the past. Because a large part of what historians are working with are the work of other historians who wrote their own histories uh, decades, centuries, or millennia ago. So what you see on the screen here are a few definitions of history from a very popular medieval author, one of my favorite medieval authors, Isidore Seville, who's writing in the seventh century. Uh, his big work that these definitions are contained in uh, is called <laughs> the Etymologies uh, or the Etymologiae. Um, and he defines history in three ways here that you can see on the screen. Uh, pause if you want to read the full thing. Um, but important here is that if we read these definitions of history, these do not look um, completely the same as how the Greeks or the Romans would have defined history. They are certainly not the same um, as modern historians would define the field. Uh, we'll get to that later in the lecture. But the basic definition Isora provides is that history, that is historia, because early medieval people are primarily writing in Latin, uh, history is a narration of deeds accomplished and through it, what occurred in the past is sorted out. That seems pretty bare bones, and I think even modern historians would probably agree with that, even though sorting out the past is something that would be debatable, right? Right. Um, especially with Isidore's follow-up statement, which is, since what is seen, that is what is seen in history or historical accounts, is revealed without falsehood. <laughs> That I do not think modern historians would agree with. Yeah. Uh, this was absolutely true for those people writing history, in the early, especially uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, that is, getting accounts from what they considered reliable sources uh, was something they considered actually reliable. That was empirical evidence. That was something justifiably used as, uh, and could be claimed as something without falsehood. The second thing Isidore talks about is what the purpose of history is, which is one of the things we're, we're also going to address. Uh, and Isidore says that many wise people have imparted the past uh, and especially past deeds of humankind in histories for the instruction of the living. This is a trope we see throughout uh, medieval historical narratives. That is, I'm recording this stuff that happened in the past so that people in the present can learn from it. Uh, so this idea uh, that history repeats itself for those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat. It's all a cliche. Um, that cliche doesn't stop with Isidore. It goes back all the way to Aristotle. Um, at a minimum. This is not something new. Um, so Isidore's purpose of history for people to learn from it um, is consistent also with modern historians, well, some modern historians, uh, and with most people in the general public. And he continues, through history, they handle a final reckoning back through the seasons and years, and they investigate many indispensable matters, uh, matters through history's succession. Uh, and now for early medieval people, generally what we're talking about here is trying to divine something about God's plan for the universe or something. Um, but in more secular terms, he also means figuring out what king lived when and what those people did and why it was important for people to know about. Third, Isidore defines different kinds of history. And this is probably where modern history may diverge more, most distinctly from medieval definitions of history. And so Isidore says there's three kinds of history. The events of a single day are called an ephemeris. Uh, we call this a diary. What the Romans called, and he goes on and continues, that the Romans called this type of daily account um, a, a, di a diurnus, and the Greeks called it ephemeris, right? Um, so Isidore, as, as the title etymologies implies, 
uh, does actually do some etymology where he's able to. Second, we call histories that are distributed into individual months calendars. That makes particular sense for us, uh, the, the general modern uh, person. We know what a calendar is. Oftentimes we see these things tracked by months. Third, he says annals are the actions of individual years. And typically the way we see them um, is in medieval chronicles is going to be something like 959 blank happened. Uh, 960, this other thing happened. 961, this other thing happened. There's very little in the way uh, of narrative or rhetoric or authorial voice or the kinds of things we typically associate with uh, historical narrative. And Isidore uh, specifies that, especially in annals, domestic and military matters are, are those things that are focused on in, in particular. He ends this section in the etymologies by saying, but history, that is something distinct, from ephemera, from diaries, from calendars, from annals, history concerns itself with many years or ages. And through the diligence of history, annual records are reported in books. And so here we see something that generally lines up with um, our kind of conception, for the most part, of what history is, is it's a narrative in a book of some kind. But the beginning of the section, right, is the types of history. <laughs> Generibus the genre, the, the generic terms for history. And it's not just history historia, it's diary, ephemeris, and diurnus. It's calendars, calendarium, annals, annales, and even things, some things we might call anniversaries, right? Anniversaries. <laughs> and so even for the Middle Ages, where Isidore clearly here has a definition of what he calls history, it's not clearly decided what history is because these other kinds of historical accounts are also included in the types of history. And indeed, this is one thing historians have to struggle with. Which of those types of sources are we supposed to include? Which of them are more reliable than others in a historical narrative like a historia as Isidore defines it? Um, because there's authorial opinion in here, are those less reliable than annals that are just recording bare bone facts? Um, or should we just be looking at a calendar of events of things that are supposed to happen? Well, that, that hasn't been decided. Um, and in, in, indeed, if you look at any uh, history book with footnotes, which is which is always a good sign that the thing you're reading um, is is probably a pretty good book to read, uh, depending on the publisher, um, that those footnotes often span the gamut of those kinds of historical accounts. Um, and indeed, uh, research uh, research methods, if you go to graduate school to study things like history or English or anything that involves a study of the past, is going to suggest that you shouldn't restrict yourself to just one kind of source unless you're doing some kind of case study or microhistory. And so where do we go from here? We don't really know what a source is because, you know, we're working with janky clay tablets um, and we're not really sure oftentimes how to read them. We don't have a clear definition of what history is, but we're supposed to make some kind of conclusion about what the heck to do with these things. Well, maybe, maybe we do something else. Maybe we try and talk about what a primary source is. Anybody who's gone through the public education system in the United States uh, will have heard the term primary and secondary source. Uh, probably in your, at, at the very least, I would hope, um, if you didn't hear these terms, you probably didn't pass your state mandated test. Um, <laughs> primary and secondary source. What is a primary source? Uh, the answer on most standardized tests, uh, because I've looked at a lot of the state standardized tests in the country, um, is going to say something like, use an example of a primary source like a diary. That is usually everybody's go-to example uh, because we all read the diary of Anne Frank in eighth grade or something. Um, so what is the primary source? Well, let's refer back to the earlier slide with our Huri and him on it. We see a rendering of a clay tablet. Is that a primary source? Again, pause for dramatic effect here. <laughs> Well, there's an argument to be made uh, in uh, uh, that it is a primary source. What is essential about this as a primary source? Is it the phys physical object? Do you need to go to a museum to fully appreciate this Huri and him? Well, in some sense, we've established it doesn't really matter because we can't read what the cuneiform says. So can we appreciate it as a rendering because this is cheaper for publish publishers to put into their books instead of a full color glossy photograph? You'll notice here on the current slide with my question, what is the primary source? We see a photograph of a statue of Cleo from one of the Vatican museums uh, made in the first century. 
Is this photograph a primary source? What you've probably encountered if you're, an, if you're uh, again, a product of the American education system is that you probably saw some 19th century photographs and your teacher pulled that out and said, this photograph is a primary source. Well, this photograph is probably from like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is this a primary source? Well, in some sense, we can appreciate many of the aspects that make this a valuable historical source. Uh, we have a high quality image. It's in color. We can make out many of the features uh, that are important for learning about art history or sculpture. Um, uh, but maybe we can't make out if there's something written on the scroll. So this, this leads us uh, to have some evidence about uh, the importance of the statue or who it might be or this kind of thing, but maybe not the full picture. And maybe we actually need to be uh, at the museum to appreciate that. At the same time, museums, uh, libraries and other research institutions are developing things like uh, uh, if you go to the Louvre website, I think they have some of this. Um, they have 360 degree uh, virtual tours of things in the museum. And so you can get a 360 degree uh, view of something like the Clio statue. Um, I think they may want to have one of the Nike statue, um, not shoe related, um, and one of maybe one of the famous Davids. Um, and so if you can do that in ultra high 4K quality, do you actually need to go to the museum? Does <laughs> that kind of view count as a primary source? Now, this is a big way of talking around that uh, sometimes definitions also don't mean anything. And whether or not something is a primary source or not is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> right. Uh, what matters more than anything else is the information that we're getting from whatever the thing is. In the case of our Huri and him, what's essential is not necessarily the clay tablet itself, but the words, um, uh, the sentences, the paragraphs, the, the ideas that are on the tablet. Um, unless there's words on the Clio statue, what matters more is the aesthetics of it, the actual structure of the object. Uh, because we don't have words to access. Which of those things is a more valuable source? Well, people are going to argue all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and usually we leave that up to academic arguments in, in things like publication to determine whether this source or that source is more valuable, especially if they're two sources um, about the same event, person, idea uh, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, object of inquiry. And we can take this even further. What about a translation of something written in a foreign language? like our Hurian hymns. Most of the things you read, uh, if you take a medieval history class uh, as an undergraduate, um, or you read something like the Iliad or the Odyssey, like many of us did in middle school or high school, you're not reading Attic Greek or Ancient Greek. You're reading a translation by somebody, a Greek scholar. <laughs> um, does that translation count as a primary source? Arguably not, mm -hmm. but are you going to be able to read the Iliad if you don't have it in, in modern English or whatever uh, uh, modern language you happen to be fluent in? Probably not. Again, uh, my argument, uh, uh, my personal opinion uh, is that what's more important is that you get access to the information contained within the text or the source, uh, particularly uh, when I'm in the role as an instructor or an educator. Now, of course, there's always something that's lost a little bit in translation. Idi idiomatic expressions and true meaning are lost. Um, that's going to be the case in any translation. Um, there's still valuable information we can pull from those things. And so I might guide people to things uh, they may not be unaware of. Uh, so if we're, if we're going to talk about Beowulf, I would recommend that people go look at the University of Kentucky project called Electronic Beowulf, where you can not only see the Beowulf manuscript, you can see it in parallel with the trans with the transcription and a translation of the text. Oh wow! This is available for free. Anybody can go look at it. Uh, if you're particularly uh, interested, you can teach yourself some old English and uh, have at it in the language it was written. In. This is actually really really cool. I have not seen this yet, guys. Uh, just so y'all y'all are aware, you'll see it on the screen too as an example. But I'm going to include the link to this in the video description. That way y'all can actually go there to the link itself and see the entire thing. This is actually really awesome. Really awesome. And I might note too that you'll see a little play button in the top left corner there. Uh, yes. They also have somebody that is going to be um, speaking the, the, the text in Old English uh, so you can hear what that sounds like. That is very cool. I'm glad you included that. That's awesome.
And so the reason people like me do things like do uh, 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 interviews for YouTube channels um, is hopefully to spread word of things like the electronic Beowulf source, um, because this is freely available to anybody um, who has access to the internet. Um, these, these sources, um, uh, electronic Beowulf was the work of um, a number of academics and scholars. It's produced books, conference presentations, all sorts of fancy academic things. Most of the people who are going to be able to engage in this are going to be able to engage in it in Old English um, or have a, a good critical edition that they're going to have on the bookshelf somewhere in their office anyways. And they may not be using this outside of a teaching setting. Uh, in my opinion, things like this are essential for members of the general public to, to know about. And it's something uh, I'm working on uh, in medieval studies is, 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 is raising basic awareness that things like this are out there uh, for people to use. Absolutely. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the, have you, uh, the medieval source book online. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Paul, yeah, Paul yeah. Hustle is, is an interesting dude, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and I might note, if we do have any aspiring historians out there, uh, especially if you are a graduate student or an adjunct or an instructor at a, at a community college or something like this, um, uh, Paul Housel, who runs uh, the Medieval Sourcebook, is looking for contributors to assemble sources for him. Oh. And if you connect to his Facebook group and have good stuff, he's, he's willing to take those contributions. Very awesome. Yeah, I'm in that group actually. I just kind of I don't I don't ever contribute because I am not that I am not that I would uh, I would be put to shame. But everything that they provide is absolutely awesome. Yeah, so uh, cool. And and not just me, but um, ev I think basically every colleague that I've ever encountered has used the medieval medieval source book for something. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty sure I even own man. I own a few of his books actually. He's done mm -hmm. some really great work too. Um, I'll even I may even include some of those in the video description too. Sure. So now the reason in me kind of breaking down what the heck a primary source is and why that term may or may not be useful for the purposes of investigating the past uh, or doing the work of a historian is that there's a lot of primary sources that we have that are important documents or texts, uh, but we don't have the original text. We don't have the Ur, what we sometimes call the Ur manuscript. Um, we don't even sometimes have an authoritative text or what the authoritative, authoritative text is, is not agreed upon or has consensus in academia or scholarship. Uh, arguably, the most prominent example of this is the Bible. Uh, and the Bible, for the purposes of the Middle Ages, uh, is the most popular text for medieval readers. Uh, it is the most uh, prominent text. Uh, it, is the, it is the text that we have the most examples of in terms of historical artifacts. We have more versions of the Bible from the Middle Ages than any other manuscript by far. Um, although up there, probably in the top 10, is Isidore of Seville's Etymologies, uh, which is why I called that text out in particular. It is a, a, it is a critical text uh, uh, for the Middle Ages. Now, what we have here, and I think Nick is going to throw this up on the screen, um, what we have here is an old text. Uh, we can call this a codex, uh, a book. Uh, the book was uh, uh, an invention medieval people claim for them. And so uh, uh, if you have anybody to thank for Harry Potter, it's medieval people. <laughs> um, this particular text is called the Codex Sinaiticus. It's held at the British Library Additional Manuscript 43725. Uh, and I would encourage you to go to the link. This is an interactive uh, uh, a text that the British Library has digitized, um, and I encourage you to go to look through it. Uh, you're not going to be able to read it uh, unless you know the language that it's written in, uh, just like our Hurrian hymns. But again, as we've, as I've kind of tried to, to intimate here, um, being able to read the text is not necessary. Not being able to read the text does not necessarily mean the text is not valuable to you. And so, if you open it, the first thing I want you to notice is the state of uh, the leaves that you're looking at. We see stains, we see rips, we see smudged ink, and this is a good manuscript. Like they took the effort to digitize this manuscript painstakingly and create a <laughs> software platform for you to be able to navigate it, smudges and all. And this is also part of the problem that historians oftentimes have. We're not just talking about broken tablets, even things that should theoretically be more well-preserved, like a book that's been on a bookshelf, encounter problems along the way. 
the library flooded. In the case of the British Library, a giant fire in the 18th century that, that destroyed a few tens of thousands of manuscripts. And so again, we're working with incomplete information, but we're supposed to make some sort of intelligent decision about those things. If you zoom in on the text, those of you with some collegiate experience might notice uh, uh, some familiar letter shapes here. Um, if you were involved in the Greek life, um, these, this, uh, this particular text was indeed written in Greek. And even if you don't know Greek, um, you might know letters like alpha and omega and nu or something like this. We can identify them uh, on these leaves. And so even though you can't read ancient Greek, you actually do know probably a little bit about the Greek language, even if it's just calling out letter names. That is knowledge, that, and knowledge is always valuable if you know how to apply it. Now, the Septuagint is a funny word. And so more commonly, this, this kind of text, not just the Codex Sinaiticus, that's this particular text, uh, but this version of a text is called a Septuagint. Now, if we do our etymology again, we know that the prefix sept, S-E-P-T, means seven, and gent uh, is, a, is, a, is, is an odd suffix uh, that means uh, 20. But in this case, it means 10 times. That's, that's an alternative uh, kind of meaning we have here. And so uh, 10 times seven here means this is, this is the 70 text. Um, where does that come from? Uh, well, the Septuagint, uh, the, the, the apocryphal story behind it, and historians get no end of frustration from things like apocryphal stories, is that the, uh, the apocryphal story surrounding the Septuagint is that uh, the Old Hebrew Bible needed to be translated from Old Hebrew um, into Greek uh, because at that time, uh, the reading audience of these texts uh, was more familiar with Greek than Old Hebrew. That is, they were trying to make translate the text to make it more accessible to a wider audience. Uh, we've addressed this point a little bit earlier. And so the apocryphal story surrounding this is that 70 of the most prominent Hebrew scholars got together they all worked from the same manuscripts, and they translated the Old Hebrew Bible into Greek. And they did this in isolation from, from each other. And so they, they, they finished their translations. They come compare notes. And miraculously, so the story goes, every translation, all 70 of them, were exactly the same. <laughs> and that's where we get the Septuagint from. Now, hopefully, if you have a, a good, rational, skeptical mind, some alarm bells are going off here. Right. Uh, and we ask the question, how reliable is that story, do you think? And if, if your guess is not very reliable, um, that, is, that is the answer I would be looking for in my classroom here. <laughs> but this story persists. And the question, the real question to me that we should be asking is, why does that story about the Septuagint persist? Now, there's all sorts of reasons we could potentially talk about. Uh, my usual go-to, because I am, uh, in many senses, a cultural historian, is that that story was important to a group of people. Mm -hmm. What that importance is, I'm not the right kind of scholar to answer that question. Uh, but we may be talking about things like... Um, uh, because this text happens relatively early on in the history of Christi in, in the history of Christendom, um, Christianity is not the default religion at this point yet. Um, it's it's coming pretty soon, uh, but not yet. And so, if you're trying to get people to convert to this new religion, uh, what do we what do we do? We make a story that sounds good. We make a story that sounds miraculous and otherworldly and supernatural, and people go, oh. That's why this is important. Because also remember, books are a new thing mm -hmm. <laughs> when the Septuagint become, when, when the Septuagint is created. And so it wouldn't be an impossible scenario that you're a person who never encounters a book at all in your entire life. And now suddenly you have uh, uh, not just one religion, but once we get to the seventh century, two religions structured around an important book of some kind. Why the heck would I place any importance on this book. Well, if miraculous things are happening surrounding this book, maybe I give this more credit. Yeah. Um, again, this is, this is hypothesizing here um, and, and, and assuming some things, uh, but these are the types of questions and the kinds of conclusions that historians are looking for when we're doing inquiry. 
why does that story persist? Why is it still around? Why is it something that people still know? And just so we're clear here, uh, the Septuagint contains the first five books of the Hebrew Bible uh, uh, translated from ancient Hebrew into Greek. Good skeptical questions we should be asking ourselves surrounding the Septuagint are, um, if we look at modern translations of any text, um, published or otherwise, how likely is it that those translations are different? Almost assuredly. So 70 ancient Hebrew scholars using ancient methods and tools and methods of assembling empirical evidence, very unlikely that that happens, right? Right. It does, does seem fairly miraculous. Now, the Septuagint, of course, is not the only Bible that existed at that point in time. It was not the only one that developed over the Middle Ages. It was uh, a popular version of the Bible. It was not the most popular version of the Bible, in my opinion, uh, after we get out of the early Middle Ages. That particular distinction was held by a version of the Bible we call the Vulgate Bible. Um, now, the Vulgate, that word comes... Uh, uh, from an association of this version of the Bible being called the Vulgar Bible. Uh, now, that doesn't mean explicit language here. Uh, that means translating the Bible uh, from a learned language, which at the time was Greek, um, into a more common language, which was Latin. Uh, so Latin meaning a more common language or language for the common people uh, rather than anything with those seven-letter words in it. This particular Vulgate Bible is from the 6th century. We, it's called the Harley Gospels. Uh, that's British Library, Egerton Manuscript, 1775. And I think Nick is going to show you an image of one of those leaves here. And so, uh, Nick, what, what, what I'll ask you to do here is let's do the same thing we did with the Septuagint. Let's look at the page. What do we notice about it? It looks like a regular book. Can you tell me a little bit about what you see on this page uh, can we read anything on it? Do you notice anything about the, the the aesthetics or the form of the manuscript? I definitely see that, one, it's in better condition than the one we looked at earlier. But I think the one thing that stands out the most, it looks like it's been written over something. Is that correct? Uh, well, this this one is, is, is probably a result of really good acidic uh, medieval ink. And so that's that's most likely... From um, the other page. From the opposite side of the page. Okay. Um, although you do bring up an interesting point here, uh, which is we do have things where things were written over. Those are called palimpsests. Uh, that is, for example, how we know most of our stuff about Archimedes uh, is through palimpsests where uh, I think we had some some psalters uh, written over some, some old Greek texts of Archimedes that nobody could read because Greek was lost for a while in the Middle Ages. And so if nobody could read it, what use is it, as we've previously established? And so some medieval monk uh, scraped off the Greek, wrote his psalms on it, and then using some imaging technology, uh, somebody looks at this manuscript, noticing something very much like you did, like, what are those words there? Right. And discovering, oh, we have a bunch of really cool texts about Archimedes. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, interesting, interesting thought, uh, not the case in this particular, uh, in, in this particular manuscript, but something that does pop up in the middle ages, uh, uh, not uncommonly. So, so tell me a little bit about the words on the page, um, how they're written. Can you interpret any of them? Um, now, Nick, you're a little bit more familiar with historical things than maybe some of the people listening. Um, but I'm, I'm expecting you're not completely fluent in Latin. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so obviously it is Latin. Um, that top word is that I want to say baptism, but I'm probably wrong. Is that yeah, true? Yeah. Or, okay, yeah. right on. Yeah, like that's score number one. Mm -hmm. um, now the words I want you to focus on uh, uh, more than 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 the paragraph at the top there uh, are the large letters at the bottom, uh, which may be easier for people to kind of see here. Um, and I want you to focus on the word. Um, uh, the only word on the second line uh, in that bottom section. So can you can you can you tell me what you what what you think this word may be? And it's the second from the bottom, correct? Yeah, the word that starts with uh, a capital S there. Oh, capital. Okay. Second. Sec yeah, exactly right. Okay. Um, now, an interesting thing to our audience may be 
um, what the Latin word for, for second in this case is. I mean, we spell second S-E-C-O-N-D, right? Right. Um, this particular this particular version of second does not contain any O's, uh, but you may be able to do a little bit of basic paleography here, and we see an S, an E, a C, and what's our fourth letter there? The V. It is a V. Now, this is an interesting thing, right? Um, that letter looks like a V to us, and if anybody wrote this outside of the context of this text, we would absolutely call that a V, and you would be right yeah. In this particular context, it is a U. Oh, that's right. So our word here is secundum. Okay. So that is obviously still second. Um, now, this is odd, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we look a little bit higher on the page, we can clearly probably make out some U's that look a lot like the U's that we're used to. Yeah. So why in this particular case do we see V's instead of U's? Well, we're returning to our clay tablets here. Uh, Romans, like ancient, ancient uh, Mediterranean and Mesopotamian peoples, uh, started writing uh, on clay tablets uh, way back the, at the uh, beginnings, beginnings of their civilization. And as, if we look at that cuneiform and we're trying to write on clay tablets, it is a lot easier to draw straight lines uh, than it is squiggly things like capital S's or O's. And so in Roman script, what we see in early script, especially those we find on things like statuary uh, and tablets, um, are that we don't see U's at all. We see things that look like capital V's but are pronounced like U's. Uh, this particular manifestation in a manuscript is a holdover uh, from, those, from those clay tablet days. And so this, this particular author had uh, apparently some training uh, in, in that kind of uh, paleographic uh, history, uh, and so we see it manifest here. And uh, uh, not uncommonly in my classroom, sometimes I, I see students struggle trying to pronounce C and V right after right after one another. Um, and so secundum is here. Um, now important here is that you immediately recognize uh, the, the modern cognate for this word, which is second. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine most most of your audience could probably pick that out too. Yeah, uh, and, and it's probably true for the same thing that happens in the third line here. Uh, we can probably all say it together. Um, the third line, that word is interpreted as the name. Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, there we go. That's what I was thinking too. Right <laughs> uh, and if we look at the very last line there, uh, we see Mark. Yep. Um, and so if we know that the Vulgate is a Bible, um, we can probably interpret uh, that this particular page has something to do uh, with the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Q, uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so we can do some interpretation of Latin because English is in some sense a Latin language, a Romance language. Uh, and so even if you don't have any experience at all with Latin things, you can open um, a manuscript like this on the British Library website and actually interpret some of the things in the document. That is absolutely awesome. So what we've talked about so far is a Greek Bible translated from Hebrew, a Latin Bible that was translated from Greek. And so, again, we, we can address the question of what the heck's a primary source and what is it good for? All of those things are primary sources in their own right. All of them uh, are, are, are significant documents and texts in their own right. Does it necessarily matter that they were translated? I think a lot of people would argue, yes, it absolutely does matter that they were translated. Uh, and indeed, if you do some seminary training, sometimes you learn all three of those languages in pursuit of your uh, theological studies. For most people, uh, the beginnings of their uh, search into the biblical past starts with the, with the book I think Nick is going to, uh, or the version of the Bible Nick's going to pull up now, uh, which is uh, the King James Version of the Bible, originally produced in 1611. Uh, this particular manuscript is from the Rare Books Library at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I think you can probably go to their website, too, if you're so interested. Um, and so the first thing I'd like you to notice um, or try and decipher is how is this different from uh, the Vulgate that we looked at a little bit earlier? Uh, obviously, besides the language. I'm assuming you can read more of the words here uh, than you could uh, on the Vulgate Bible. So I feel like one of the main differences, if I can interject here, the paper for one, right? Absolutely. 
Yeah. Uh, that is an important thing to notice is that we're now printing on uh, a paper. We're not on parchment, which is made instead of animal skin. So keep going. What else? What else you got? I'm starting to see notes in the side margins or references. Sure. Of course, the font is completely different, primarily yeah. due to the language, I would assume. So, so tell me about the difference between how the, how you think the words got onto the page between those two manuscripts. One, of course, being probably written by hand, and the other one would have been a machine or a stamp. And that is a that is a very important thing to be able to recognize. Uh, it's one of those common sense things. If you put the two next to each other, it's super obvious which one was handwritten and which one was right. printed. Um, but understanding that printing was occurring um, is an important thing to recognize. So uh, if we look at uh, Michael Clanchy's book, um, so Michael Clanchy wrote a book where he argues that we have maybe one or two percent of the total documents uh, produced in the Middle Ages, maybe, at being generous. Um, that survived to the present. And most of it was probably lost to the past. And that the process of making a book in the Middle Ages before printing was an onerous, time-staking task. And one of the, one of the statistics, I think it's Michael Clancy's book that, that brings this up, is, is, is how, how long would it take to produce um, a Vulgate Bible? How many pages could a, could a monk write in a day? How many animals would it take to make a Bible, right? depending on the quality of the parchment? Uh, I think Clanchy indicates that to, to create a New Testament, not just the New Testament, not including all the Old Testament Bibles, I think Michael Clanchy uh, uh, stated it would take somewhere around 150 calf skins um, to make a New Testament. Again, this is, this depends hugely on the size of the book, but let's say a relative. I think he I think he said something. You know, if you're going to produce a reasonably um, fancy looking version of the New Testament, something like 150 calf skins. Um, now, if you take if you take stock of the wealth of the the typical medieval family, maybe they have two cows and a horse. We're also talking about a very valuable product here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the end of that, the end of that discussion, Clan, she says something like, um, the average medieval monk could probably scribe, uh, in, in the, in his allotted time, maybe two to four pages a day. Wow. So the fact that we have thousands of manuscripts of the Bible that survive from the middle ages, understanding what that process is to create a book, right? Not even going into the details of, of making the parchment and making your ink and the quills and this, that, and the other, learning how to write and read in the first place, understanding uh, the time it took to create and the expense that it took to create a manuscript, especially a nice manuscript with things like gold leaf and expensive ink colors on it and stuff, um, makes the fact that so many of these Bibles, medieval Bibles uh, uh, survive an, an even more important factor. And so that's why historians sometimes say context matters. Yeah. The context of the way that books were created in the Middle Ages matters to illustrate their importance. If those thousands of manuscripts are indeed only one or two percent of those things that survive, right? Right. Um, it makes it less so, arguably, for the King James Bible. Hmm. We can mass produce these things. Yeah. We just at every hotel room in the world now. Yeah, that's true. Also, probably depending on your geography. <laughs> uh, in, in the Western world, at least. Uh, many hotel rooms, are, you're going to find one of those in your bedside table. Um, uh, not so with the Middle Ages. So uh, those of you who may be, especially from a, a Germanic kind of family background, may have an old Dutch Bible or something mm -hmm. uh, that was passed down through the generations. And that was a really important book. Because even though it was printed, and one of the major factors in printing was the uh, much more rapid dissemination of knowledge, including things like the Bible, printed books were not cheap in and of themselves. More people had the ability to buy them, uh, but much like many academic texts today, a $250 uh, a barrier to buy a, a really specific kind of monograph on a particular subject uh, is enough to steer most people away from that particular text. Um, the same was true for many for many editions of things uh, in the early uh, decades and centuries of printing. Um, it was able to do it 
but at a at, at, at a not insignificant kind of cost. Right, right. And so for our general audience, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting the, uh, the King James Version of the Bible back up there. Absolutely. So what I want you listeners and viewers to kind of look at here is that you may notice um, we have things that are spelled differently here. Um, if we notice right under uh, that big chapter one abbreviation on the left-hand column, you see the creation of heaven and earth. We may note here that that V, uh, if you can see it, see looks it. much like a U. And now we've come full circle with the Vulgate, where Vs were Us and now Us are Vs. It's all very confusing sometimes. <laughs> uh, we may also notice that things have different spellings. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, a little bit further down in that introductory little uh, chunk right there before the big capital I, we see uh, the creation of heaven and earth, of light, of the firmament, of the earth separated from the waters and made fruitful, of the sun, S-U-N-N-E, very creative way of spelling sun, moon, M-O-O-N-E, and the stars, S-T-A-R-R-E-S, end of fish and fowl. And so we may notice some spellings that are slightly different, but importantly, and I'm assuming for our, our, our fluently English audience, um, those things are all able to be read and understood by you despite their different spellings. Um, and we may notice letters that look a little bit different. And so we see uh, the word beasts there with that nice, um, that nice serif S right there, uh, where the S actually bleeds into the T there. And this is something very common we see. But again, most of us who are fluent in English will be able to recognize what that word actually is. Uh, and if you can do that, well, congratulations, you're doing some basic paleography. Can I point out one thing real quick, just sure. in case it doesn't get addressed? Because I'm really curious about this. Number four, and God saw the light, that it was good. And of course, if you look, it was, is completely, mm -hmm. a, not only a different font, but it almost looked like somebody inked it in much later. Would you say that's true? Yeah, so this, so this is a complete guess. But remember, we're still relatively early on in printing in 1611. Yeah. Uh, my best guess here, and again, this is a complete guess, um, if you go to the University of Pennsylvania website where the manuscript is held, they may have some knowledge on this, um, is that whoever was supposed to be putting uh, uh, putting those letters into the typeset there um, forgot to put in it was, <laughs> uh, and and it didn't get included, and they had to go back and fix a bunch of these things. Interesting. Fired. No. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. Uh, but uh, that, that's my best guess for that. I mean, people aren't perfect, right? Right. Uh, unless you're the, the 70 Hebrew scholars with the Septuagint. That is true, um, in which you are perfect. And, yeah. Um, and so that's my best guess there. Either it was left out of, of a few... Um, of a few uh, uh, texts like this, and somebody fixed it later on, and maybe there's another version where it was was fixed, and we can compare those two. Um, sometimes that's interesting to find out that provenance. Uh, or it could be somebody noticed the mistake and fixed it themselves later yeah. on. Both of those things are possible. Uh, I, I don't know about this particular manuscript, yeah. uh, uh, but those, those are some likely possibilities. Uh, but that's a, that's a really interesting thing to point out. I hadn't noticed that before, so thank you for for pointing that out. Oh no, you're good. I saw that. I think it's because I had read a a while back. I read Misquoting Jesus by Doctor Ehrman, and he talks about text quite a bit and how like you can see minor changes throughout time as some people add to it and some people don't. And like when I saw that, I think by reading that book, that's one of the first things I for some reason I automatically look for. Huh? Very cool. Very. No, cool. And it's and that's that's basically what we're doing here, just across languages, right? Oh yeah. So if we go look at the Septuagint uh, uh, Old Testament uh, compared to the Vulgate Old Testament, they're going to look. Of course, they're going to look completely different. They're in different languages. That's true. <laughs> um, but if we look at the content of them, right? Um, you're having to interpret Greek into Latin uh, yeah. by a non-fluent Latin audience, right? Right. Because uh, medieval peoples, even though most of them knew Latin, um, what we would call fluently, it wasn't their primary spoken language anymore. True. Something else. Um, and so it's also going through that lens in the translation process. Oh, yeah. And I'll uh, be sure to, at some point, I'll actually show all the ones we've looked at so far side by side. That sure. way people can really get a good look at it all at the same time. Yeah. Now, the King James Bible is usually rolled out as um, the premier early English, uh, not 
early English meaning something like Old English or Midi, uh, uh, Middle English, um, an early version of an English translation of a Bible, um, and that's usually the go-to one. Actually, one of the earliest ones is a version we call the Geneva Bible. Uh, this is the Bible, for example, that was on board the Mayflower when it made its way over to the colonies. And it was indeed the Bible of choice of many of the Protestants and Puritans from English-speaking countries who settled in North America very early on uh, during the colonial period. Uh, the New Testament of it was finished in 1557. Uh, the whole Bible was finally completed in 1560 for its first version, uh, although I think the most popular version of the text was the 1599 version. And so here we see, again, that uh, we're working with a rendering of a manuscript. We're not working with an image of it like we have been on the previous manuscripts. Uh, but hopefully you've taken my, uh, my clay tablet suggestion to heart, and we don't actually need to see it because we can see the words on the page here. These words, however, we can actually probably read. You might notice a difference between the spelling of book in the Geneva Bible and book on the King James Version of the Bible, where the King James had B O O. Uh, B-O-O-K-E. We have B-O-K-E here. So we're missing an O. Uh, depending on who you ask, we might say boca, boca here or some, some variation of this. We also see our nice tall S's here for Moses and Genesis. And if you back up a couple of pages where we see an introductory letter to Queen Elizabeth, we also see a holdover from the Vulgate and those ancient Romans with U's as V's again. Even though uh, as, as you can probably very easily tell, this was a printed one, too, and they were thus very capable of doing U's and all of its curves. And so, again, this is one of those things where if we know a little bit of background and context, it helps us understand some of these weird things we sometimes see in printed books. We saw V or U's that looked like V's in the Vulgate. They're still doing U's as V's a thousand years later. Um, and to me, that sort of stuff is really cool. Um, one thing I might point out in particular um, is you'll notice in the first line there, um, under the most virtuous and noble Queen Elizabeth, and you might note here that Elizabeth ends with the T, and we don't have an H there, mm -hmm. uh, Queen of England, France, A with a squiggle over at D, Ireland, and then something <laughs> funky happening. Yeah. Uh, Nick, do you have any idea what the A squiggle D and that funky thing happening on either end of Ireland might be. So I, okay, a part of me wants to say the the weird thing at the end is ETC, like et cetera, et cetera. It, it absolutely is. Okay. And the one before Ireland, I'm assuming is and. You're absolutely right. Okay. It's an abbreviation of and. And again, this is one of those things, as you indicated uh, with the King James Bible, somebody could have goofed in the printing, Mm -hmm. And so we had to use an abbreviation annotation to make sure that people understood this was and, and not the uh, the Latin preposition odd, which would mean going toward something. Uh, or they wanted to keep this nice little pyramid kind of structure that's going on um, consistent. And so they couldn't put the and in because that would mess that up. So we abbreviated it instead or something. <laughs> <laughs> queen Elizabeth is like, I'm the queen of the British Isles, and this is what you send me. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, maybe that's why the King James Version was more popular later on. That's true, that's true. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right about the et cetera right there. We're all familiar with that abbreviation. Mm -hmm. um, and you might note that if we spell out et cetera, it's E-T space and then the word cetera. Uh, that is, and the things that come afterwards. And you might note here that et is abbreviated by this little weird thing. And if you look real close, you might be able to pick out something that looks like an E smushed together with something that looks like a T. Mm -hmm. um, and your, your, your interesting little historical factoid of the day um, is that that is the precursor to our ampersand, that is shift seven on modern keyboards. Whoa. Um, and if you, if you look, if you can just Google history of the ampersand um, and uh, you can, you can kind of see a progression of those things as they happen. Um, and one of these other apocryphal stories surrounding things like learning the English alphabet um, is that when little early uh, medieval English boys and girls were learning their alphabet, uh, so the story goes, again, this is apocryphal, is that you'd learn uh, all, your, all your letters and then you'd go uh, W, X, uh, Y, and per se, Z or Z, depending on where you're from, 
uh, and per se, that is and by itself, uh, Z. And uh, uh, the, so the story goes, uh, and that is that, that little funky ET smushed together there uh, was used so commonly in that form of the abbreviation uh, that it was its own distinct letter in the alphabet. Um, now you can believe that or not. You can you can do some digging online, uh, but that's always a fun story uh, that kind of illustrates that uh, words and even symbols that we use um, uh, sometimes have their own uh, interesting history. If you if you uh, do a little bit of investigation here, um, and I don't want to get too far afield here because we need we do need to we do want to talk about a little bit about the Geneva Bible, um, but uh, maybe Google. Uh, what what the Bluetooth symbol came from? Uh, it, too has, it too has a medieval origin. That is uh, true. And so we've addressed most of what we've what we've talked about here. You'll note you'll note differences between um, the King James version of the Bible and the Geneva Bible here, where um, uh, we see significantly more notes in the margin on this one. Um, notes aren't requisite here, but they happen very often. Sometimes they're referring to other relevant passages in the Bible. Sometimes it's this particular versions, uh, version of the Bible. Uh, uh, the author wanted to note something they thought was important. Uh, maybe it's, in, uh, if, if especially if we're looking at medieval manuscripts, sometimes they include things, uh, other stories that were of interest to the author. Um, especially if we're looking at the New Testament, sometimes uh, the author will refer to things uh, salient to that point, or the thing that Jesus said, um, referenced back to the Old Testament, noting particular passages or books. Uh, we may also note here, too, that uh, we see uh, versions of things like our little paragraph symbol. So note there right next to the number 14, we see a little uh, early version of the paragraph symbol. Um, sometimes those things were used because uh, indents and tabs and this kind of... Uh, 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 these kinds of aesthetic structures we have in modern uh, uh, books and, and essays and these sorts of things were not quite solidified. And so sometimes it was hard to determine where a paragraph began or ended or uh, uh, when somebody started talking, especially if it was somebody um, important. Um, so like when Jesus or God says something, those are important to note. Yeah. Um, so we see here, let there be light, has mm -hmm. some stuff surrounding it. Uh, and so this particular author wanted to have those asterisks there uh, to, to, to denote that, hey, God's saying something here. You need to pay attention. And so, again, all of all of this stuff that we're talking about here is without reading any of the actual words or understanding any of the passages that's contained within the text. And that's really the ultimate point here. Right. Um, is that. Um, Historians will say that the most important thing for them to be able to have are the texts and the information that it contains. We talked about this with primary sources. Uh, and I agree with that, absolutely. Uh, I consider myself a documentary or textual uh, investigator. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of information, and especially for novice historians who sometimes might be intimidated about a particular text or thing that they're looking at, that if you, even if you don't read any of the words or you can't read any of the words, you can still look at these things and get some really interesting stuff out of it. And so we've got one more example uh, to look at today. Uh, and this is another English Bible, uh, but it may not be the kind of English uh, you may be familiar with. And so we are going to be looking at a book called The Old English Hexateuch. Yeah, that's what I figured. I thought it would be something like that. Uh, and so Nick's going to pull up uh, another version of this from the British Library. And uh, this is a uh, uh, London British Library cotton manuscript, Claudius B4. And that kind of citation methodology also sounds complicated. Uh, it's really not. Um, and I, again, I don't want to get up on a tangent. I, these are just things I think are interesting. Um, so if it says cotton manuscript, what that means is originally that manuscript was in uh, the Robert Cotton collection from the 16th century. 16th century? I think the cotton was 16th century. In Cotton's library, he had all of his manuscripts on different really giant bookshelves uh, that had a bust of a Roman emperor at the top. And each of the shelves was labeled A, B, C, D as you go down the shelf. And so all that reference number means, Cotton Claudius manuscript B4, is that this manuscript was originally in Robert Cotton's library 
um, on the Claudius bookshelf with Claudius at the top, on the second shelf, that is the B shelf, fourth manuscript over. Um, and so again, that kind of citation sounds like something completely foreign to maybe the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress cataloging system, uh, but is in fact, if you have the appropriate information to approach it, really super easy to interpret. Um, so, so Nick, tell me about what you see on this page, uh, particularly the image. Who is this person? Uh, what are they doing? What, how do we know that's who the person is? All right. So I'm assuming this is Jesus who's walking on the water. Um, you can see his hand is pointing up. You can also see he's got his little uh, almost like Christological halo there. That's exactly what that is. And you're, you're spot on, right? Even if you couldn't identify anything else, if you're familiar with the Christian tradition at all, you see a dude walking on water, it's going to be Jesus. Um, we may note here he's wearing a particularly nice classical Greek or Roman robes. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of those things where uh, Jesus was a brown guy from the Middle East, but we oftentimes see him, any type of significant biblical or historical figure, we oftentimes see them uh, in classical robes. Right. Um, um, if you go, if you look at the uh, apotheosis of Washington, for example, in the Capitol building uh, in Washington, D.C., you'll see uh, George Washington in some nice classical robes. Um, and so walking on water is the obvious giveaway, right? Um, but you noted uh, a finger and you also noted a halo. Halo is perhaps uh, another good dead giveaway. Uh, uh, and, you know, he's covering up some of the cross, but there's a nice little cross there behind it. Right. Uh, and you notice he's pointing his finger up. What the heck's going on there? So now this is just me guessing. I'm assuming he's mm, he's pointing up towards the sky because you can also see the sky up above. And I don't know if that's meant to be a symbol of like his divinity. The finger is meant to be a symbol of his divinity. Okay. Uh, not quite in the way uh, that you're thinking, though. It's a good guess, though. Um, we, we do see Renaissance art like uh, 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 like Raphael's image of the Academy with Plato pointing to the sky and uh, uh, Aristotle pointing to the ground. Right. Because Plato is concerned with the universal things. Right. And Aristotle is concerned with those particular things. Um, so so not a bad interpretation by any means. Um, here, however, is a particular medieval uh, artistic expression, which we call the finger of God. Um, and so that finger is the thing that does all the divine stuff. Um, that's, that's what's doing the miracles. Uh, those of you who, if we get a little bit into medievalisms here, uh, that's what happens when we see uh, uh, Monty Python, the big finger coming out of the sky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh William has a PhD in medieval history. Um, he, he's, uh, uh, he's been to some of the conferences I've been at. Um, but... Uh, that's that's the finger of God there, and that's what does all the godly stuff um, as a metaphor or an allegory or whatever kind of uh, a word association we want to use there. Uh, but that's another one of those dead giveaways. Halo, walking on water, finger of God, got to be Jesus. Right. Um, now, if you zoom into the top text there that starts with that big capital blue letter. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. This is Old English. Uh, you, can get, you can do some comparisons with the Beowulf manuscript if you want to. The letters are going to look a little different, but again, it's, hand, it's handwritten. Uh, can we make out any of these letters? That's completely, yeah. So let's, let's start with the first two words. Uh, see if we can make anything out. So obviously, I would guess that God is the first word. Perfect. Then we see a C. We see a couple other funky letters. We see some D's with crosses through them. We see what looks like a lowercase a. Man, this is, yeah, I can't believe I'm not getting this at all. So, well, we found out with Secundum um, that letters appear not always like what they're actually supposed to be interpreted as, right? Right. And we know, as fluent English speakers, that English words do not start with CP. So remember, this is the beginning of the Bible, Old Testament. Oh, so this is the... Uh... But this isn't Genesis, though, right? This is Genesis. Oh, it is Genesis. Okay. So that's is that actually going to say, and God created the heavens and the earth? Or is it? Nailed it, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so as God created, right? 
Um, uh, but we might, depending on who you ask, this may be God Quatha or God Kratha, right? <laughs> and so we see uh, we see a diphthong um, that has since made its way into EA instead of AE in modern English. Um, we see created, uh, which right now those weird Ds with slashes through them is a letter called an F or a thorn. Interesting. Um, that makes the the th sound, the th or the v, depending on uh, depending on context. Um, and and so this is this is God created. And again, if you if you're familiar with the Christian tradition and more specifically familiar with the Genesis creation story, um, you know those first two words in any version of the Bible are God created the heavens and the earth. Right. And so if you know we're starting in Genesis, you can make as you did an educated guess that. Even if I don't know what the heck that is, that those right. words are probably some version of God created. Um, and again, this is one of those things where even if you know nothing about the text in question, uh, you can look at it and you can get some information out of it, even if it's even if the information is not completely accurate, um, uh, even if you can't interpret any of these letters. We know this is something biblical because we see Jesus walking on the water. Right. right? Um. Now, uh, I might ask you, since we can zoom way in here, if we look at the, at the edge of the text uh, on the left, uh, maybe in the top corner of the left-hand side, what can you tell me that you notice here um, that looks a little apart from the letters on the page and stuff? Mm -hmm. All right, so I can see that, one, it's obviously worn. Um, it's got minor water damage. There are holes. Mm -hmm. That appears to be some kind of, uh, can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. That appears to be some kind of possibly like a scribble or a mistake. And of course, I'm assuming this is all handwritten mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Now, if we look on the right hand side of the page, do we see holes in a similar kind of fashion somewhere? Uh, that appears to be holes, but they don't look exactly like the ones across. Mm -hmm. So sc scroll down the left hand margin of the page. Do we keep seeing holes? Probably not on the image, but... Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say small, little small marks. Right? Yeah. So what do you imagine those are for? For the binding. Good guess. But remember, we're on the edge of the page oh, here. Oh, yeah, that's true. Page. Uh, uh, although we do have manuscripts where sometimes the binding was reversed or things were scratched out or parchment okay. was... Okay. So what would that be? All right, hit me with it. I'm curious now. So how do you think medieval scribes got their lines to be straight? Oh, okay. So these are what we call prick marks or pricks. Um, uh, they, they were not being mean, um, but um, <laughs> what medieval people had to do was make their own lines. And so uh, usually this was done with something like a, uh, uh, something like a pen knife um, or a needle or something like this, you stick it into the, the parchment um, and you either trace a line and make your own lines. You can see, you, you can just Google examples of medieval lines um, and see examples of this. Um, or they had a string with something like chalk on it and you know, do one of those things where you, you can just snap it and make right. your own lines and then you can erase them later. Sometimes they drew their own lines and then scratch them out afterwards. Sometimes they use the pen knife to kind of uh, make grooves for lines instead. But when we see manuscripts like this, we can identify those prick marks uh, and, and see evidence of where those lines match up. And indeed, if we look at this, in, in general, they line up with where we, we would expect the lines to be. That's true. Uh, and so that was just a, a little thing, but an interesting thing we can see on some, not all, but some manuscripts. Oh, yeah. And so understanding things about uh, kind of the physical nature of a text, which is, which is mostly what we've been doing here, um, sometimes helps us get interesting information and, and, and sometimes helps direct historians' investigation of things. So, for example, we've, we've talked about books that were printed on paper and manuscripts that were created on parchment. Uh, now, because parchment is a lot more durable than paper, um, we have a lot more parchment that survives in the Middle Ages than paper, we see our per first paper documents around the beginning of the 14th century, I think like 1312 maybe. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head. And I mean, papers made out of wood, wood pulp, uh, things like papyrus are made out of reeds. Uh, and so it's a little bit more durable. Um, but what can we do with that kind of information? Well, 
using nice fancy things like uh, DNA sequencing. Um, we can take something like parchment. I think a group out of North Carolina State is pursuing a project now, or maybe they may have completed it by now, uh, where they are sequencing some of the DNA of the animals in the parchment, the DNA fragments from the parchment in medieval manuscripts um, to help determine migration patterns of domesticated animals in the Middle Ages. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, not a for sure thing, right? Yeah. Um, but it is, it is biological material. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes we can get little... Uh, snippets like this, right? Interesting. Uh, we're, or we can use an MRI machine uh, to look for for hidden texts that have been erased, uh, like our Ar Archimedes texts that I mentioned with Palin's tests earlier. Um, and so there's sometimes a really interesting conjunction of uh, the hard sciences uh, and 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 things like the humanities uh, for for really interesting purposes. Um, and I, in, in my opinion, there needs to be more of those kinds of collaborations. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my, my overarching opinion is uh, uh, increasing knowledge and people's access to knowledge in whatever form it takes is, is beneficial to everybody. And the same thing is true of some of the ink on the page. Uh, ink, for the most part, was made from plant material uh, uh, or often, sometimes ink material. Uh, or sometimes animal material. If we look at things like uh, dark purple ink, if you look up the Book of Kells, um, that really dark purple ink that is that's incredibly valuable. Um, one way to get that kind of dark purple ink is a snail that's only found off the coast of some Mediterranean locations, and it oh, takes yeah. um, uh, some extreme effort to get it. Um, you could just use some flowers and some other things to get purple that's almost as as rich. Uh, right, but doesn't have the status and and right. and, and a prestige associated with it. So thus, uh, uh, much less not used for things like popes or emperors. Right, um, but by being able to determine what kind of animal or material that came from, again, it helps us sometimes place manuscripts we don't know where they came from. And so, if you have a if you have a manuscript in England with ink that you're able to determine came from uh, medieval Greece. Uh, medieval England and medieval Greece, especially if we're talking the early Middle Ages, they weren't supposed to have done anything with each other yet. Interesting. Um, yeah. How did that manuscript make its way over? So the materials did, the manuscript did, or the person did. Um, and so there's interesting avenues of investigation here. Again, not even looking at words on pages here. And so I might direct you now to uh, uh, slide number 11, okay. uh, where after we get from the King James Version of the Bible, the Bible takes all sorts of other manifestations, forms, and languages. Uh, last time I, I did any sort of looking up on this, I um, I was able to find a thing that said the Bible has been translated into 438 different languages. Um, this includes uh, odd things like Klingon. If you've never looked at the Lolcast <laughs> Bible, um, I would suggest looking it up. Uh, that link is still active. That's funny. Good old internet meme fashion. Uh, Absolutely. Cheeseburgers are mentioned, and <laughs> we have popular versions of the Bible in in modern English, like the New International Version or the Revised Standard Version, and this sort of stuff. Uh, all of which are different from one another. Uh, and so, again, we can return to that question: is which one's most correct? Which one's the best one? Um, those sorts of debates I don't anticipate ever stopping. No. Um, but they are interesting things to think about, to investigate. Um, and depending on your particular religious viewpoint or purpose in using the Bible, different versions of that are more appropriate than others. So, for example, if I want to know what early Protestants used um, in North America, I'm not using the Vulgate. Uh, I'm not going to use the New International Version of the Bible that was printed in 2017. I'm probably going to use something like the Geneva Version if I'm doing academic research. If I'm doing anything in uh, medieval Europe, especially Western Europe, uh, I'm probably going to be using the Vulgate. Yeah. Um, if I'm talking about uh, uh, things like sermons um, or English vernacular in the Middle Ages, I might be looking at something like the Old English Hexateuch. And understanding that even though these uh, texts or manuscripts like the Bible go through all of these different versions— that each of those versions has its own role and place in historical investigation. And oftentimes, uh, especially for novice historians, understanding the appropriate way, maybe maybe a better phrase is the most appropriate way uh, 
um, to use these different versions is oftentimes a very difficult task. And so this leads us into a more modern definition of history than Isidore's, but ha that has some components if, you, if you'll move to slide 12. Uh, and that's from R.G. Collingwood's The Idea of History. Uh, his version, uh, this was written posthumously in, in 1946 from a manuscript of his from, from the 20s. And his definition of history, I, in my personal opinion, I like his definition more than, than most of the others that I've read, where he says, history is a kind of research or inquiry that fastens upon something we do not know and tries to discover it. Its object is to interpret the evidence of human actions that have been done in the past. And he just kind of, there's other stuff surrounding that in that particular chapter, but that's a good summary of, 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 of my conception of what I think history is. Um, is it some type of inquiry that can take many manifestations and we're simply trying to find the answer to what the question is. And not only find the answer, but we have to find an answer and then we have to interpret that answer uh, to other people in some way. Whether that's through me teaching a class, writing a paper, talking to you, making a PowerPoint, creating a video, whatever it happens to be. We have to interpret that information we've got from the past um, and in some way verbalize or rhetorize uh, the conclusion that we've come up with in our head, which is his own kind of method of interpretation and translation. Right. And so I might note another, uh, uh, a few last things here. I, I didn't think I had palimpsests um, in this presentation, uh, but I do actually have a link to one. And so I know this was a while ago, but uh, it's a good little link. And then these, will, these will be in the presentation. Two last things to note are conventions that we see oftentimes in modern writing and modern books and modern note-taking especially. And, and so, oftentimes those things are obvious, right? Right. Uh, so, so you'll note in the first image that I sent you, uh, we see scribbles in the margin. Mm -hmm. We see a nice little figure of a dude. <laughs> um, sometimes we see things like this uh, uh, in sermon manuals or from a, from a preacher's archive or something, um, where little figures like this might mean something like, uh, hey, I need to write a sermon about this, right? You're, you're taking notes. That's all right. they're doing. And you'll note in the top right-hand corner there, you'll see a little 88. Uh, some librarian at some point in time uh, numbered these pages, maybe for an edition or a translation, and was making sure the page numbers in their edition matched up with the page numbers in the manuscript. It may also be for stuff like library indexing. You'll also see some notations, in, uh, what we call interlinear, that is between the lines, uh, notations on this manuscript too, uh, at least a little bit. And so medieval people were doing many of the same things that we do with our texts or, or textbooks when we look at them, uh, which is mark it up so we can access the information more easily next time. Um, in the second image, uh, you'll see uh, a more clear example of a lined medieval manuscript here, right? You can, you can clearly see the lines there. But also we see things we do, which is we underline the important stuff. Now there's, there's, there's two general ways we see this appear in medieval manuscripts, though, is underline the important stuff in red, or because of the work involved in creating medieval manuscripts, we underline the stuff in red where we made an oopsie, and you're, mm -hmm. you're telling the audience to ignore that section. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we see this more explicitly or, or more clearly to our understanding in the third image I sent you, uh, which is where we see red and blue things crossing out in the section saying, uh-uh, I, I, I messed this part up, don't include this. Uh, but, you know, we also included things like gold leaf, and so we at least want people to look at the pretty picture. That's true. <laughs> and so we might end this w with a question. When do we say history begins? We've talked a lot about written records today and artifacts of the past. And oftentimes, uh, I mean, I identify myself as a documentary or textual uh, investigator. And many historians will agree with you. Um, what do we do with archaeologists and anthropologists? Um, <laughs> stuff oftentimes before written texts were developed. So do we start with anth anthropological data with like early man, uh, hominids, the, the evolution of Homo sapiens, something like this? I, I don't really have a good answer to that. <laughs> Uh, that's for people to continue to discuss and debate. There are there are fields uh, that are called like big history yeah. uh, that are contributed to uh, by by guys like uh, Carl Sagan and and, and these sorts of, sorts of, sorts of folks um, that say, well, history really began uh, uh, with the Big Bang. Right. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with those sorts of things. Um, I might call that uh, you know maybe time began with the Big Bang. Right. 
Um, my interpretive interpretation of history is more in line with Collingwood's is, is that it involves human action and our interpretation of those human actions. Uh, and there are many versions of investigating the path that are not uh, investing in the past that are not distinctly history. Um, Isidore tried to, to parse some of those out for us. Yeah. Um, but my interpretation of history is, is purely on human action. Um, although obviously evidence of all sorts of other stuff that happened in the past, uh, leaves its own type of evidence behind, uh, that it's, uh, that, that, that is its own distinct field of investigation just as worthy uh, of it. I've noticed because we've talked about the Bible quite a bit in this and the different versions of that and why mm -hmm. you would study this one in this era or if you're studying this subject and why you would study this one if you were studying something else. Um, one thing I've noticed a trend in YouTube comments especially is people tend to disregard the Bible regardless of translation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They Oh, it's, it's all fiction myth. And I've always taken a stance to where even though I'm an atheist, I disagree with that. I think there is a large amount of history in the Bible. And we can argue about the mythos aspects of it, of, of course, too. But a book that I've always said, if you discard the Bible, and if you discard the subject of Christianity, you'll completely miss out on one of the most fundamental aspects of the Middle Ages. And I was wondering if you would agree with that or not. Uh, yeah, you can't have the Middle Ages without Christianity. Absolutely. Um, in, in the same vein, you can't have the Middle Ages without Islam either. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's exactly what I've said too, or, right on. Or Judaism. Um, because those religions were so crucial um, to those to their respective cultures, uh, community identity, uh, and, to, and to most people's personal identity too. And so, for example, if you look at arguably the best historical author of the Middle Ages, William of Malmesbury. Mm -hmm. um, he was a member of the clergy. There's biblical stuff throughout um, his historical narrative, despite modern historians looking at him and going, William of Malmesbury is anticipating modern methods, modern versions of what it means to be an evidential historian and these kinds of things. Jesus and God stuff all the way throughout. Saints are doing things or supernatural events, right? Right. Um, and an important thing to keep in mind here, uh, and one thing I really try to emphasize to my students, um, is that our judgment of the past is to try and interpret them on their own terms, um, not placing modern moral judgments yeah. on those things that people were doing. Um, so, for example, um, it's real easy to go, slavery is bad. Right. Nobody... In the 21st century, hopefully nobody in the 21st century is going to disagree with you. Yeah. Um, it's a much different question to go, why did people who had slavery think it was okay? Yeah. And that is a very difficult thing to try and wrap your mind around. Um, I usually do that discussion in, in a U.S. history course, specifically in the context of transatlantic slavery, right? Because that's a yeah. chattel slavery is its own unique, terrible thing. Um, and so... Um, it's much more difficult to get into the mindset of somebody from the past, especially working with, as we've established, this incomplete evidence. And so uh, if we understand that people in the Middle Ages absolutely thought things like um, saints did miracles, supernatural events happened, um, seeing omens in the sky were important, because we see those things in historical accounts. Right. In those annals that are supposed to be bare bones, we see things all the time that are, you know, uh, there were there was a blue moon or I saw a meteor go across the sky. That meant bad stuff was going to happen. Yeah. Um, and then later on, the bad thing happens. Yeah, exactly. And um, medieval people absolutely took that as empirical evidence, which is why it was included in those texts. Um it's a different discussion entirely about whether or not they thought those things actually happened. Yeah. Um, and so some of these things are rhetorical tropes. So things like we see the bodies of saints never decomposed and they were, uh, um, the bodies always smelled sweet is a very common thing that we see. You open up a casket, somebody that's been dead for 40 years, it ain't sweet. Yeah, no, not at all. Not going to look too bright, right? <laughs> but when, when, it, when you record, everybody went to go see the saint when they were reinterred somewhere else. Every record about that saint is going to say the body didn't decompose or, or, or the, uh, uh, the, when the body was translated, 
it was pristine and it smelled it smelled sweet right right because it indicated the importance of that person and um, their their godliness right because yeah. of all the good things that they did during their lifetime and so if medieval people believe that if they placed that amount of importance on those sort of things it's a in in my opinion it's a disservice to those people in the past to 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 push those off as well that couldn't have happened because that that's not the way the world works yeah exactly um, because our 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 my mission as a historian is not to figure out how the world worked yeah it's to figure out how the people that lived in that world um, interacted with it how they understood it how they how they how they interacted with each other how they interacted with the systems. Um, the societies and the cultures that were in place at the time. And so it's one of those things where uh, uh, this, is, this is where fiction is helpful sometimes. Yeah. So if we, if we go to one of those classics, uh, uh, Connecticut, Ar- uh, uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, right? Yeah. A big chunk of the book is, is the protagonist trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. I don't understand any of this. This is not the way that I think the world works. Um, and the same thing for medieval people. They're approaching it from two completely different, you know, what what are these what are these modern conventions? I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, or more recently, in an adaptation of the same story, uh, where that kid goes back in time and you know shows him a CD player, right? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I forget the name of the movie. I do too. I um, but it, it's one of those things where those are, for all intents and purposes, different worlds entirely. And again, my job is to help people as as best as I can understand. Uh, the uh, uh, the way those people perceived the world and interacted with it uh, in a way that's approachable for a modern audience. Um, that is a really, really difficult thing to do. And so my, my basic interpretation of history is the more people understand history and appreciate uh, the reasons people did things or didn't do things uh, and whether those things were uh, what we perceive of as, as a positive or a negative according to modern social norms, helps us appreciate those values. Um, again, we can appreciate them as negative values or appreciate them as positive values, but we can, we can use that cliche, walk a mile in somebody else's shoe here. Right. right? And uh, if we can go, oh, I understand how they thought about that. I don't agree with that at all. Yeah. Um, and again, I want to, I'm going to avoid a soapbox too much, but um, <laughs> if, for example, uh, again, I'll bring up U.S. history just a bit because of what I anticipate is probably your primary audience and their, and their familiarity with history. Um, if we understand that the context of somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, concepts of nonviolence, that the context of that was lynching and mass race riots with dozens and hundreds of people killed. Yeah. It makes nonviolence more remarkable to me. Right. Um, and understanding that in his head, that's what he that's that's the culture he grew up in and the risks that he knew were there. Yeah. Um, and still pursued nonviolence. Yeah, that's that's pretty remarkable. I mean, the fact that and I've always like admired that the fact that some people, even though they're living in incredibly violent and unstable time periods to where you just never know. And eventually violence did eventually, sadly and tragically, end Martin Luther King the fact that he clung to that belief system in a violent world i've always admired people like that they uh i feel like they have a much stronger constitution than say certain people like myself since we're on the subject of american history i have two ancestors specifically that fought in the civil war and controversially of course they fought for the confederacy one is uh, general william barksell who is going to die at gettysburg uh the brigadier general of the mississippi army and the other one was a no-name dirt poor guy who fought for uh, tennessee and I've always imagined trying to figure out like the uh, the ideological differences between these two guys that I'm related to, different clo- you know classes. One of them is rich. One of them is really poor. One of them is going to die at Gettysburg. Uh, the poor one will actually have to get a uh, pension from the U.S. government because of the, the shrapnel that he got hit with during a battle. He couldn't work afterwards. Mm-hmm. And so I've always tried to imagine like what their different lives would have been like, what their different perspectives were. One of them highly benefited off of slavery and the other one, well, he, uh, was not as, I guess you could say, privileged. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's interesting to try to put yourself in those perspectives 100%. And we can take this full, full circle back to, yeah. uh, to early Christian martyrs, right? That's true. 
And one of the reasons why martyrs are so common sometimes in English texts is because of the importance of what they perceive themselves as doing. And so if you're an early Christian martyr and you get the Roman government that says convert or we're going to chop your head off. Right. Um, and you say, no, I'm not going to denounce Christianity. Right. Um, that should illustrate to an audience reading that how deeply that person held that particular set of beliefs, rightly or wrongly or whatever your opinion on yeah. religion happens to be. That person perceived it as incredibly important because they got their, their they got their head chopped off for it. Yeah. Um, and in order to emphasize how uh, significant of a change Christianity can bring to somebody's life, Christian leaders promoted things like Christian martyrs as exemplars of the faith. Um, that if you really understand Christianity in the way that we interpret it, um, you will absolutely believe in the things that they want, uh, that Christianity is, is supposed to be about, and you will do it unto death. Yeah. And nobody, after you, after you understand these things, nobody will be able to sway your beliefs in those things. Um, and again, modern conceptions of religion and, and faith and these sort of things notwithstanding, those people, uh, many of them, right, deeply held those beliefs. And it's, it's that kind of thing that we're really trying to figure out. Oh, yeah. Is how did that, you know, in, in the context of religious history, right? How did that kind of deep belief manifest? How um, did people develop that kind of, of deep-seated belief in religion or theology uh, or, or theological systems? Um, and we can go back to that other question too. And that's that's a, in, in that kind of context. Um, it, it was the it was the it was the Jesus message, right? That was more insignificant, right? Jesus didn't need to pop up and go, "Hey guys, make sure you believe." Yeah, um, it was the message that was there. That was that was the the the, uh, the calling or the, the the point of contact there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. This is concluding our presentation for today. I wanted to thank Dr. Soberad for spending his time with us and actually taking the time to better educate us on some very complex and complicated issues when it comes to the study of history, how we look at it, how we interpret it, and eventually how some of us teach it. Thank you so much for coming on. It means a lot. I'm looking forward to doing more of this with you in the future. And honestly, we can't thank you enough. Nick, thanks, thanks very much for inviting me to do this. Uh, it, it was good fun. Um, and uh, hopefully if there's something that's of, that's of uh, particular interest to people that I can do, um, you'll have me back. Uh, and if anybody has any particular questions, I'm, I'm happy for Nick to facilitate some of those to me. Um, if I can get those answers in a reasonable kind of time frame, I will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much and have a wonderful night.